All right. Good morning, church. God is good all the time. And all the time, we are going to get used to talking a little bit this morning, I hope. So, I know we're a little fewer in number than normal, but don't be afraid to say amen or hallelujah or clap your hands. And we'll talk about why that is a little bit more as we get going this morning. It is a beautiful warm day in San Francisco, which is uh, not something you say all too often, right? But it's a, it's a wonderful day. And so this morning we are in week seven of our eight-part What Now series. And if you're just joining us for the series, uh, this is a series where we have tried to, to ask one basic question or, or do one basic thing, and that is to discover who the Holy Spirit of God is to the best of our ability. To the best of our ability. And we believe and we recognize that understanding the Holy Spirit of God fully and completely is impossible to do. But we recognize, uh, or and we recognize the Holy Spirit is a mystery of God. It's not something we're going to be able to understand fully. But we also recognize, and we also believe, that Jesus meant what he said when he told his followers that it was better for him to leave so that another could come, that another comforter could come. And so that other is what the Bible calls a paraclete, which is a fancy way of saying comforter, encourager. And that that paraclete was to come into the lives of believers to encourage them and to equip them. And so what now is a series that has encouraged us to ask, what happens next? What happens next when Jesus, when the Son of God dies, is buried, resurrects, and ascends into heaven, leaving people who love and follow him, both encouraged, because here he he defeated death, but also confused, perplexed. Like, what happens now? What do we do next? He's gone. And so you think about businesses and organizations, right? For any business, for any organization to be healthy, that organization has to have the ability to function and grow and thrive in the wake of a leader leaving. That Sometimes a CEO experiences tragedy. Sometimes founders have moral failures. And sometimes leaders burn out and start food trucks, right? Sometimes things happen and leaders leave. And the only thing that we should come to expect in our world is the unexpected, right? That whatever curveball can happen will happen in time. And so the Bible reminds us that tomorrow is never, never, say never with me, church. Never Never guaranteed. The Bible says that tomorrow is never guaranteed and encourages us to live that truth. And so we think about the life of Jesus When Jesus died, was that expected? Was that expected? No. The unexpected happened. When Jesus resurrected, was that expected? No. The the, the unexpected happened. When Jesus ascended, the unexpected happened. And 50 days later, when a group of disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, guess what? The unexpected happened. And it just so happens whether you realize it or not, we don't celebrate this in the same way that we celebrate Easter Sunday. But do you guys recognize and realize this is Pentecost Sunday, church? This is seven weeks since Easter Sunday. This is Pentecost Sunday. This is the, the week that we celebrate what happened that day 2,000 years ago, right? For 2,000 years, the Holy Spirit has been showing up and He's been doing what is unexpected. He's been showing up when He was least expected. He's been doing the miraculous, and He's been changing lives. And so as we move into the home stretch of this series, my hope, my prayer is that you've been blessed. My hope and prayer is that you've been encouraged. My hope and prayer is that you've been stretched to some degree by this series, that you're seeing Scripture maybe in a different way than you ever have before. And so certainly if you've not had a chance to listen to all the parts of this series, I want to encourage you to do that. You can go to our website. You can go to YouTube. You can listen to podcasts. You can catch up on all the previous lessons of this series. And so I've I've wanted us to be stretched for these eight weeks. I've wanted to stretch myself for these eight weeks. I've wanted us to ask questions that maybe we've never asked before or to consider God in ways that maybe we've never considered him before. And more importantly, to live on mission in ways that maybe we've never, ever lived on mission before with our faith. Because if we simply go home, And week after week after week, we do nothing with this. We do nothing to speak boldly. We do nothing to live courageously. We do nothing to to trust humbly. Then we've wasted some precious time. But if by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, if we've chosen to live differently, 
then this time with the Spirit not only has the potential to be life-changing, I think I would be so bold and go so far as to say that it will change your life. The Holy Spirit of God will change your life. And that's not my teaching. It's not John's teaching or Michael's teaching or Jay's teaching. It is the Holy Spirit of God and the Word of God that changes lives. And so I pray that like that Coke and Mentos activity a couple of weeks ago, right? Um, that, that we might be willing to unscrew that cap a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more each and every day so that when God's ready, the power that is within us can burst forth and can leave us in awe, can leave us uh, amazed, can leave us perplexed. We need to be willing to unscrew that cap a little bit more each and every day. And so as we head into this morning's lesson, it's worth noting that summer is in the air. You can feel it around you, which means it is graduation season. There have been graduations upon graduations upon graduations. Preschoolers are graduating, kindergartners are graduating, fifth graders are graduating, middle schoolers are graduating, high schoolers, colleges. You, you get the idea. And I just so happen to be married to a beautiful eighth grade middle school teacher. And so this past Friday, she celebrated their graduation where they sent a new class off to high school. I'm sure John did the same in high school. Got to say goodbye to some, some beloved seniors in high school. And uh, in addition, she got to welcome a, a class of seventh graders into eighth grade, of which my, my daughter just so happens to be one of them. And so Lord have mercy on my soul for that. All right. But I think that's a great segue as we, as we think about and talk about what graduations represent. It's a great segue into this morning or this week's topic, which is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Because there's a, a good chance that you've heard the word anointing. You've heard the word anoint. You've heard anointed mentioned before in and around church. But it's one of those, those Christianese words that unless we're in church, like we, we never use. And I'm not even sure a lot of us really understand the meaning of that word. And so we, we want to try to unpack that a little bit more and actually understand what it is and why anointing is significant in our faith. Because we might hear statements like, oh, that guy has a real anointing. Or Lord, I pray that you would just anoint her. So, so what are we actually saying when we use that word, right? That's the part of the message that we're going to try to unpack this morning. And so as we get ready to go there, I want to invite everyone just to stand up. Let's go to God in a word of prayer this morning. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, Father, we, we, just, we thank you for this time to come together. And to, to pray to you and to talk to you and to recognize that you are present. You are here. You are with us and in us and moving through us, Lord. You are real and you're alive. And Father, today I, I pray that as we study your word and we, we try to understand what it means to be anointed by the Holy Spirit, that you would move through us, that you would give us boldness, you'd give us courage. You'd encourage us to ask questions that maybe we've never asked before, Father. And Father, that you would, you would help us and equip us to go from this place and to live out our faith every step of the way, every day, every opportunity we have as we encounter new people, as we encounter loved ones and friends and neighbors and coworkers. Lord, give us the courage to use the Holy Spirit, to lean on your power and to trust in you faithfully, Father, to live out this life that we live. We live in a challenging world. We live in a challenging city in which to be Christians, Lord. And I pray that you would help us to just be a blessing, to, to, to pour ourselves out, to be a, a, a person of peace and a person of comfort and a person that, that is, is not anxious in the face of trials and tribulations, Lord, but a person who's just grounded in who you are, that we trust you fully. When our bank account says zero, Lord, we trust you when we aren't sure where food's going to come from the next day, Lord, that we trust you. That no matter what, what the world throws our way, when we're persecuted from every angle, Lord, that we would trust you. And we would not allow ourselves to be bogged down by the worries of this world, but we would have an eternal mindset, Father. I, I pray for that. Thank you for today. I pray that your, your hand would be on this time. I don't want a single word that comes out of my mouth to be a word that's my own. I, I pray that your Holy Spirit is speaking through me. And that your Holy Spirit's allowing our ears to hear a new truth or a new message, or maybe an old one, but that we, something that we need to be reminded of, Father. Encourage us today. Each day has enough trouble of its own, Father. So encourage us and help us to live out our faith boldly. And church, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can be seated. 
Uh, Open your Bibles if you would. We're going to be in Acts chapter 10 this morning. Acts chapter 10, if you have your your apps or your Bibles, whatever you have with you, I definitely encourage you to do that. Uh, As we left off last week, we were in Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 9. And if you remember last week's message, the the church in the wake of of 8 and 9 was facing this huge wave of persecution. That after the stoning of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, Uh, They were led in large part by this guy named Saul. And so Saul was going around along with other people and they were persecuting the church. They were killing Christians. They were imprisoning Christians. And they were trying to put an end to this new way, this, this this new belief in the person of Jesus. And the beautiful part about all that, if you remember last week, is that God was able to take something that appeared to be bad on the surface, which is persecution, and he's able to use it for good because as Christians begin to be scattered, they also serve to spread the message wherever they went. They spread the message of a risen Christ in all these new places. And so what was meant to harm Christianity actually served to further it. And so last week, we we heard a story of a guy named Simon who left a life of sorcery to believe in Jesus. We saw it in the life of this Ethiopian eunuch who who, uh, was an official for the Ethiopian queen, and he believed in Jesus. And we saw that most prominently in the guy named Saul, right? If you remember Saul, who was stopped on a road where he was on his way to arrest Christians and instead came face to face with Christ himself. And so the very man who was on his way to persecute, imprison, and kill Christians suddenly was in the synagogues teaching people to believe in Jesus. And that is an amazing turnaround. And I want to encourage you just for a moment to take a step back and appreciate what just happened in Saul's life. Because it's easy for us to read this and to know the story and not appreciate what God was doing. But it's a reminder to us that God doesn't look at oppression or opposition in the same way that we look at oppression and opposition. When a lot of us face oppression, we get down, we get discouraged. We go, man, this is, this is not the way we want to do things. But when God sees oppression, he sees something different. We see oppression, but God sees what? It's on the screen behind me. He sees opportunity, right? We see oppression and God sees opportunity. And that should be really, really comforting to us when we're tempted to think things like, man, the church is in trouble. Think about that. How many times have you heard people say that in and around your community? The church is in trouble. We got to do something. The church is in trouble. Think about this, guys. The church is not in trouble. Satan is in trouble. The church is alive and well, and God wins. The church is bigger than it's been at any point in history. Don't believe the lies. The church is not in trouble. It doesn't mean that there isn't work to do. There's tons of work to do. But Satan is the one that's in trouble. We know how the story ends. We've known it for a long, long time. And so chapter 10 of Acts happens in three phases. There's three things that are going to happen in the story of Acts. Number one, we're introduced to a guy named Cornelius. We're told that Cornelius is a centurion in the Italian regiment, which is a, a fancy way of saying that he's, he's got a position of authority, and he's got about 100 people under him. And we're told that he was a devout man, that he was a God-fearing man, and he was a deeply, deeply prayerful man. And so Cornelius is given a vision by God. And God tells him, I want you to send some men to Joppa. And there you're going to find Simon Peter. And I want you to bring Simon Peter back. The next phase is Simon Peter's phase. And we're told that that Peter has a vision. In verse 10, he becomes hungry. He wants something to eat. And while that meal was being prepared, we're told that Simon Peter falls into a trance. And he saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. And it contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, surely not, Lord. I've, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean now. And we're told this happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. And if you just step back and kind of think about that story, it seems really, really random. It seems really, really strange in light of everything that we've been talking about to this point, right? It seems to have no relation to anything we've been reading. But as we we begin to read a little bit more, we begin to understand exactly what is going on here. Because as this vision ends, the Spirit tells Peter to go downstairs. And he says, there are going to be men who are down there waiting for you, and I want you to go with them. And so as he begins to talk to these men, the men say, hey, we've come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous man. He's a God-fearing man. He's a man who's respected by all the Jewish people. 
And a holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. He says, Peter, God wants you to come with us and to give a message to Cornelius. And so Peter goes because he's also received the same message. And as he arrives at Cornelius' house in verse 28, he says, you guys are well aware, right, that it's, it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit with a Gentile. But he says, God has shown me something. He's shown me that I should not call anyone impure or anyone unclean. And he continues in verse 34. He says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Now, the specifics of this story, I'm only sharing to serve as context for what we're going to be talking about. So I don't want to get off on too many tangents, but you may remember that last week we mentioned this briefly, right? In the book of Romans, that guy Saul, who was persecuted and became a Christian, whose name became Paul, he's going to refer to this teaching as a mystery. He says, this is the mystery that God has revealed. And that revelation is what just happened in Peter's life, that Gentiles as well as Jews can belong to God's chosen nation of Israel. Uh, raise your hand if you're a Gentile. We talked about this a little bit. Raise your hand if you're a Gentile. Okay, there's a few of us who aren't raising hands, so I hope we, we've learned that we're some Gentiles in this room. And so our belonging to the nation of Israel, we learn, is not based on our genealogy or who we were born to, but on our faithfulness. He's going to teach it's about whom you belong to. And so that's why a Roman centurion can share the same faith as a very Jewish Simon Peter. And it wasn't until now that Peter began to understand that. And in fact, we're going to uh, read later on in Galatians 2 that Peter in some ways is still going to continue to struggle with this dynamic later on in his faith. He's going to struggle with welcoming Gentiles into his faith. He's been Jewish his, his entire life. And you don't just change your thinking in, in a moment like that, but he's trying. But the reason that Peter is here at Cornelius' house, the reason that Cornelius called for him in the first place was to receive a message. And that message was short and it was simple. And it was about who Jesus is, what he's done. And, 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 and he brings it all to a close in verse 43, if you read along. He says, all the prophets testify about him, about Jesus, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And those words, church, if, if, we're, if we're not too familiar with them, if we really stop and think about them, those words should be music to our ears. Those words should be music to our ears because those words bring hope to Cornelius, someone who is not Jewish. Those words bring hope to Cornelius' family. And as everyone in this room cannot trace our lineage back to Abraham, it also brings a great deal of hope to who? Do this. To us, right? That all who believe have forgiveness of sins through Jesus. If we believe, that applies to us. And so as Peter finishes saying those words, the Holy Spirit shows up in that moment. And the Holy Spirit is poured out miraculously on everyone who was there, whether they were Jews or Gentiles. And it's interesting here because it's only after they receive the Holy Spirit this time that they go and are actually baptized into the name of Jesus, which is a little out of order for how we typically hear that uh, happening. But there's something Peter said that I want us to drill down a little bit further into this morning as part of this series. Because in verse 38, as Peter is sharing his message with Cornelius, he says something interesting. Verse 37, he begins, he says, You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the, of the devil because God was with him. And there's a lot happening in this text. If we read Acts chapter 10, there is a lot that is happening here. And with so much happening, it's easy for us to, uh, to ask, 
very obvious questions that emerge from this text. Like, you know, what does Acts 10 actually have anything to do with food then? Is there something that we can glean from that? Or, well, you know, what is the relationship between baptism and between receiving the Holy Spirit? Or why is this whole Jew and Gentile thing even a big deal? Those are all some obvious questions that come out of Acts chapter 10. But as we ask those questions time after time after time, when we get into this chapter, uh, we can, if we're not careful, we can miss or we can deprioritize some of the questions that we should be asking as well. Namely, like, what does it mean to be anointed? And what is this whole anointing of the Holy Spirit, uh, or anointing of Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power actually about? What does that mean? Because traditionally, when we read the word anoint, if we understand that word at all, and I'm not sure a lot of Christians do, we understand it as something having to do with oil, right? In fact, it literally means to pour oil or ointment onto someone or an object in a ritualistic fashion. That, that is the literal definition of the word anoint. <clears throat> but if you read Acts chapter 10, it's pretty clear to me that what Peter is saying about the Holy Spirit in Jesus' life has nothing to do with oil or very little to do with oil. That he's talking about something else. And that word anoint is a word that is used all throughout Scripture. We're just saying a, a, this is a season for a new anointing, right? It's a word that we use a lot. But it's not a word that I think we dig into a lot. The NIV uses that word 141 times. And about half of those times, it's talking about something having to do with oil, anointing something with oil. Because in Exodus chapter 30, God's going to tell Moses, he says, I want you to take some olive oil and I want you to add into it some myrrh and some cinnamon and some calamus and some cassia. And he tells Moses, this is a sacred oil. I want you to use this oil in the tent of meeting. So rub it on the tent of meeting, put it on the Ark of the Covenant inside the tent of meeting, and put it on everything else that's in the tent of meeting. Basically he's saying, take this stuff and rub it on everything to make it nice and holy for me. And in the New Testament, we read of how people were, were using oil or anointing oil when they were sick or when they needed to be healed. And in fact, when Jesus was buried, we're told that Mary and Mary and Salome are on their way to buy some spices in order to make an anointing oil to anoint his body. So there's very clearly a place for using oil uh, when blessing and praying for one another as Christians. But as I alluded to a moment ago, there is another use for the word anoint. And this is one of those times when it pays, it pays some dividends to have some familiarity with languages other than English. And I, I don't have any Hebrew familiarity, but I do have some Greek. And, and the Greek demonstrates or shows something uh, that I think is, is important here because there are two words in Greek that are translated anoint into English. The first word is the word alepho. It's a, the Greek word that the Bible uses to literally talk about anointing with oil. But the second one is the word creo. And the Bible uses creo for a specific kind of anointing, a different kind of anointing. And so while it may still involve the use of oil, it's a much more specific kind of anointing that's reserved for a select few people. In fact, Creo in the Bible is only used, to the best of my knowledge, for three different kinds of people. I want to go through those with you a little bit today. Number one is a king. The word creo is used to anoint a king. In 1 Samuel 9, the very first anointing of a king happens as the prophet Samuel anoints a man named Saul. This is a different Saul than the one we've been talking about. But he anoints King Saul to be king. And Saul is going to represent the very first king in Israel's history. Subsequent to that, in 2 Samuel chapter 2, David is going to become the new king. And he is also going to be anointed by the men of Judah who come to anoint him and ask him to be king over them. And on and on and on it goes. King after king after king is anointed to lead God's people. It's true of Absalom and Solomon and Jehu and Joash and Jehoahaz. There's an anointing that is placed on a king that God has called. Uh, and so when God places his blessing on a king and commissions that king, God anoints them. And God's promise to King David, and this is important, I want you to pay attention to this phrase. God's promise to King David is that his family's claim to the throne will never end. Okay, so remember that. Number two is priests. In, in Exodus chapter 29, Moses is instructed by God to anoint Aaron to be the high priest over Israel. And later, we're going to learn that Aaron's sons are also going to be anointed. And God tells Moses, he says, anoint them just as you anointed their father, so they may serve me as priests. And their anointing will be to, a, 
will be to a priesthood that will continue throughout their generations. And again, what we learn is that when God places a blessing on a priest and commissions them, he also anoints them. And again, God's promise is that his anointing on their priesthood will never end. You should start to see a pattern here. The third is prophets. In 1 Kings 19, God's going to tell the prophet Elijah to go and anoint anoint the prophet Elisha to be his successor. Similarly, the, the prophet Isaiah is going to write about himself. He says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And so again, we see when God places his blessing on a prophet and commissions them, God does what with them? Say it loud for me, Lord. He anoints them, right? And so God's anointing is on three kinds of people. King, priest, and prophet. I'm going to say that again. God's anointing is on three kinds of people. Kings, priests, and prophets. And if you're anything like me, if you're an Apple fanboy like I am, there should be all sorts of bells that are going off in your head right now. Because in 2007... Steve Jobs walked on stage and he told the whole crowd that was there, he says, uh, today we're going to be announcing three new products. And the crowd cheered. He said, the first is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. And the crowd went wild. The second, he said, is a revolutionary mobile phone. And the crowd went wild. And the third, he said, is a breakthrough internet communications device. And the crowd applauded. And then he recapped. He said three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls. A revolutionary mobile phone. And a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod. A phone. And a breakthrough internet communicator. An iPod. A phone. And this is verbatim. He says, are you getting it? He says, these are not three separate devices. This is one device, and we are calling it, help me out. You guys know what this is, right? It's the iPhone. And that moment, whether you realize it or not, significantly changed not just the entire Bay Area, but it it changed the world. Because if you have a smartphone in your pocket, uh, it, it owes that day to its existence. It's because of that announcement. Whether you're an Android fan or an iOS fan, it all started right there with that announcement. And so God's anointing is on three kinds of people. It's on a king, it's on a priest, and it's on a prophet. Are you getting it, church? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Fear not, daughter Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect. He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you, and anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. God's anointing is on a king, a priest, and a prophet. And church, help me out. His name is what? Say that nice and loud for me. His name is on Jesus, or his name is Jesus. And so what we learn is that word creo is a whole lot more important than we probably realized before because the root of that word sounds an awful lot like what, church? Christ. And guess what? If you speak Hebrew, guess what that word is there? Messiah. That's the word for anointing in Hebrew. Christ or Messiah. And as we read the Bible, the Bible speaks about many anointed people. There are many kings and many priests and many prophets, but there is only one anointed one. And so God doesn't anoint them with oil. That's what mankind does. When God anoints, he anoints with the Holy Spirit and with power. And that's what Acts 10 tells us, that God came and he anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power. The Father anointed the Son. And so much like all these graduates who are going to take their tassels in the last couple of weeks or in the weeks to come and move them from one side of the cap to the other as a sign of their readiness, 
as a sign of their commissioning to move forward to the next stage of life. And much like kings and priests and prophets of old would be anointed with oil as a sign of their readiness and their commissioning to take on the, on the task of serving God, the Holy Spirit was placed on Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, to signify his readiness and to signify his commissioning by the Father to do what needed to be done, to proclaim the kingdom of heaven, to be the redeemer of all of humanity by going to the cross, by dying and defeating death and resurrection. And so what Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3 is this, and I'm going to substitute the word Christ here because I want us to understand the significance of this. So that in Christ or in the anointed one Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into the anointed one, have clothed yourselves with the anointed one. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in the anointed one, Jesus. And if you belong to the anointed one, then you are Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to the promise. Church, Jesus was anointed and he was commissioned to save your life. Do you realize that? He was anointed and he was commissioned to save your life. That you were dead in your sin. You were dead in your sin until Jesus came and bought you back from your sin. You had no hope until Jesus gave you hope. You had no life until Jesus gave you life. And you had no future until Jesus gave you a future. But guess what, church? That's not the end of the story. Because Jesus didn't redeem us simply for us to take our inheritance and do nothing with it. That in the same way, uh, we don't give people an education and expect them to go and do nothing with it, right? No, there's an old saying that with great power comes great responsibility. So when we get a great education, what are we expected to do? We're expected to go be a functioning member of, of society. We're expected to improve ourselves, improve our family, improve our community, and improve our country. That's why we receive this free education that we get. So graduation is a rite of passage. And it demonstrates that you are commissioned, that you are ready to use your new education to go and put it to work. And the same is true of us, that we've been given this beautiful gift through Jesus to live as saved people, to live as redeemed people. And the Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, that it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us put his spirit in us or in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And I'm curious, did you catch that? That that anointing that Jesus received through the Holy Spirit has also been given to who? Say it loud, church. Us. us. 1 John 2.20 says, You have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. And that anointing means something to us. It means that God has prepared us, that God has commissioned us, and he has empowered us with work in mind. He's given us a special duty or a special task. The apostle Peter, Simon Peter, in writing to the church, in writing to us, said this. He says, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're God's special possession so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, he says, but now you guys have received mercy. And what Peter is wanting us as Christians to see is that because we believe in Jesus, we have been welcomed into God's family. We have been welcomed into God's chosen people. And that carries a responsibility that you and I are not just average people anymore, church. We belong to a royal priesthood now. And we have a very specific job to do. And that job, according to this text, is this. To declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. That is our job. That if you've received the Holy Spirit, you have an anointing. You have an anointing to declare praises. And I think of it like a badge on a police officer or a uniform on someone in the military. Both of those items uh, are used, or, or both of those items say that a person is equipped and empowered to do a job, don't they? That the anointing of Jesus signaled the beginning of ministry and you have that same anointing in your life. 
You have a badge. You have a uniform. You have been commissioned by the Holy Spirit to go and declare the praises of Jesus. And that means, church, that we don't leave this place and return to our previous life. We don't leave this place and just flip a switch and go back to the way we were living. No. When that badge is issued, you may be off the clock, but you're always a police officer. And when that uniform is issued, you may take off, you may be off duty, but you're always a Marine, right? There is never a time that we leave this priesthood behind us. It is always a part of who we are, that in every moment, in every walk of life, we are called to declare the praises of Jesus because the Holy Spirit of God has anointed us for that purpose. And that means that the same expectations that you have of me as a minister are also explicitly placed at the feet of everyone in this room. Because I am not a priest, we are all priests. And I am not a minister, we are all ministers. We are all called to the same level of holiness. We are all called to the same level of purity. We are all called to declare his praises. And so if you hear what I'm saying, church, say amen. Amen. If you hear what I'm saying, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. I I want it to sound like you guys mean it. Because we are called, think about this, to declare his praises. We shouldn't be uncomfortable saying amen. We shouldn't be uncomfortable saying hallelujah. John the Baptist once told people, he said, he must increase, Jesus must increase, and I must decrease. And we sing songs that say, less of self and more of who? Thee, right? God. Less of self and more of thee. And so friends, we live in a world that rewards our increase. Like we are encouraged by the world to be proud. We are encouraged by the world to sing our own praises. We walk around on on Facebook and on LinkedIn and Instagram telling the world how great we are. That's what the, the world encourages us to do, to sing our own praises. But that's not the way of God. God tells us to be servants. God tells us to be humble. God tells us to sing his praises. And church, that's what a priest does, that he or she lives a life that is fully devoted to declaring the praises of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. And so in just a moment, we're going to have an opportunity to declare the praises of Jesus. And I want to encourage you to be uncomfortable in doing so. Be uncomfortable. Be comfortable being uncomfortable. You know, King David said that he would be humiliated in his own eyes in order to celebrate the Lord. You remember that scene where he's dancing naked through the streets. He says, I will be humiliated in my own eyes in order to celebrate the Lord. So if you've never shouted amen, church, shout amen. If you've never shouted hallelujah, shout hallelujah. Here's your practice. Shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. If you've never clapped, clap. Stand. Thank you. Dance. Sing. Do whatever you need to do to celebrate Jesus, to declare his praises. Raise hands. Do whatever it takes. But let's get real, church. We're fewer in number today. That that, that shouldn't stop us. They should be able to hear us across the street. We should be that excited about who Jesus is and what he's done in our life. We were dead to our sin, and we are alive in Christ. Once we were people as Gentiles who were not shown mercy, and now we've been shown mercy. Once we were not a people, and now we are a people. We have a job. We've been anointed by the Holy Spirit of God to declare the praises of Jesus, who redeemed us and bought us back from our sin and gave us life everlasting. We have eternal life. So church, let's not be bashful. Let's not be shy. Let's not be intimidated about declaring the praises of him. He should, it should be happening in every walk of our lives with our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, our family. We should not be bashful about declaring the praises of Jesus. People should know from the way that we talk how much we love and are passionate about who Jesus is and what he's done in our life. And church, I just want to invite you to stand, sing with everything you have, and let's keep declaring his praises this morning. In Jesus' name, let's just stand, church. Amen.